Okay, now uh, what I would like to do is to uh, do a series of videos on how astrology works. I've gotten a number of requests from you guys over the years. Uh, do a video explaining how astrology works. Do a video on astrology. Uh, and so uh, we'll go ahead and do that. I, I'm going to plan this probably as four or five different videos on astrology. Um, in this one, we'll be doing sort of astrology 101. Uh, we'll just look at my birth chart since I know it the best. Uh, we'll go through that and we'll look at the chart and then we'll look at the transits for today, the transits that I'm having for today. Uh, and we'll just look at the language and the ABCs of it and see how it all works. And then we'll move from there to uh, reincarnation. Since I understand um, I have the birth charts for three or four of my past lives um, and you can look at astrology and learn how to link it to past lives if, if you have the, the date and place and time of your previous lives uh, then you can you, you can look at the linkages and you can see the karmic threads you, you can actually see them um, the best book for beginners by the way is Rob Hand's classic horoscope symbols it is an excellent introduction to astrology it's written for beginners uh, and Rob Hand is very very smart he's not a new age guy at all um, however he does not believe in reincarnation so he's not getting the full picture uh, astrology and reincarnation go together as a single package and if you don't have the belief in reincarnation uh, you're only getting half the picture uh, because the two are interconnected uh, your astrological birth chart is a karmic snapshot of where you have been from and where you are going to go to in this lifetime it is a snapshot of all your potentialities um, and so let's then go ahead and uh, look at the first chart here which is uh, my birth chart and uh, discuss it here and so as you can see what we have here is a snapshot of uh, what the sky looked like when I was born. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona, 1968, uh, at exactly 6.21 a.m. And so the bars here, th these are the most important points, these four black bars. This is your ascendant. This is what was rising out of the eastern horizon. This would be the descendant, anything that was setting there as far as planets go. Um, this is the noon, what's called the midheaven and directly beneath it would be the Imam Kowali or the uh, Midnight. Uh, so those are the four corners. Now these planets, be it said, are rising. Um, but that is of course an optical illusion based on the fact that what the planets are actually doing, and we'll look at this when we see them in the transits, they move counterclockwise through the zodiac, not clockwise. They only appear to move clockwise because the planet rotates clockwise. Uh, it goes around the sun clockwise. In fact, six of the eight planets rotate on their axes uh, counterclockwise, that is. Only two of them, Venus and Uranus, rotate on their axes clockwise. So if the planets are going around the sun counterclockwise and the sun itself spins counterclockwise, um, it gives the optical illusion that the planets are rising out of the east and setting in the west, as, as though they were going around the earth. They are not. However, it does count when you're born where they're at with relation to the background of the fixed stars. And for astrology, really, the only thing that matters is the ecliptic, which is basically the zodiac, the 12 signs of the zodiac here. And the ecliptic is a, a band that exists at a kind of tilted angle with respect to the Earth's equator. The Earth has a celestial equator, too, that is projected out into space. But what matters for astrology is the celestial equator, which is tilted. Uh, and it's divided up into, of course, as everybody knows, 12 signs of 30 degrees each, uh, beginning with Aries. Um, so when I was born, let's start here. On my ascendant, I'm a Cancer, so you can see my sun here is in Cancer. So let's identify the planets. Sun, Moon, Venus, Mars, Mercury. And then down here we have Jupiter. And then further down we have Pluto and Uranus. Over here we have Neptune. And then going all the way back up here, we have Saturn. So those are the basic planets, but there are some other signs here too that are important. Um, the most important of these are the, the moon's north and south lunar nodes. Uh, this is the point where as the moon orbits, um, slightly tilted with respect to the ecliptic, the points at which it enters and crosses the ecliptic is the north node and the south node. And these have to do with karma and reincarnation. Your south node has to do karmically with where you have been, where you have come from. Your north node is trying to tell you where you're going to, 
uh, where you're trying to get to. Um, and this is absolutely verifiable. I used to ignore the nodes as bullshit uh, when I didn't believe in reincarnation. I believed in, figured out astrology long, long before reincarnation. Um, so it's absolutely essential. And then you can also use the asteroids, but that's, there are so many asteroids that we get into a huge problem, as Rob Hand points out in Horoscope Symbols, of o overwhelming the system with too many variables, and then it just becomes a, a parody of itself. But I think this one here, Chiron, which is a dwarf planet that orbits, I believe, in between Saturn and Neptune, um, is associated with healing. Uh, and this one works. I've looked at a bunch of charts of doctors and healers, and they all have Chiron aspected at one of these four angles. The planets that you have aspected, and an aspect means that the, they're simply in relation to something, in relation to the four angles, gives them a particular amount of power. Now, with regard to the symbolism of the angles, the ascendant here represents uh, your personal relations with others uh, in, a, in a general sense, whereas the descendant has to do with your relationship to one-on-one -on -one people. So these are private one-on-one -on -one relationships over here with the descendant. The midheaven has to do with the public. Um, it has to do with the career, uh, the public. Um, a lot of famous actors have a bunch of planets in, in a peacock's fan tail around this area. So you might say that the upper six signs here, let's say in this case houses, which we'll discuss in a minute, there are also 12 houses, um, is the public sphere. The lower six is the private, the personal sphere. Um, so it matters where these planets are at. And celebrities very often, you look them up, Harrison Ford, Liam Neeson, they always have this peacock fan going out across the public sphere up here of planets. Um, so then we have the Zodiac, of course. Um, we have Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. So we have the 12 signs and their, in, their associations, but they also have, um, each one is associated with one of the four classical elements, and they go in this direction, Aries with fire, uh, Taurus with earth, uh, Gemini with air, and then Cancer with water. Then it starts over again. Fire, earth, air, water, fire, earth, air, water. So those are the elemental associations. Um, and some of that has bearings on uh, relationships. If fire, let's say, goes up, whereas if an Aries a uh, person is in relationship, let's say, with a Taurus where Earth goes down, they're going in opposite directions. So compatibi compatibility factors may or may not be an issue. It just depends. Then you also have the quadruplicities, uh, or rather triplicities, which has to do with uh, the groupings into three of cardinal, fixed, mutable. So a cardinal sign initiates a cycle, just as Aries initiates springtime. So and a fixed sign stabilizes, and a mutable is dissolving. Cardinal, fixed, mutable. Cardinal, fixed, mutable. Cardinal, fixed, mutable. So we have those uh, quadruplicities and those triplicities. And there's also polarities. There, there are yin-yang aspects to each of them as well. I don't pay that much attention to that. Um, so then there's the issue of the precession of the equinoxes because the precession precesses backwards, the springtime sign precesses backwards by one degree every 70, 72 years, so that over the course of about 2100 years, it precesses back thir 30 degrees, back through a whole other sign. So we in the West use the tropical zodiac, in India they use the sidereal zodiac, which takes that into account. But the tropical zodiac is connected to the four seasons, in some ways, it might not seem concrete, but it actually, I think, as Rob Hand argues in Horoscope Symbols, it's actually more concrete because it's tied to the four seasons. Um, so there's that aspect. Okay, so, and let's see, what else did we miss? This little guy here is a, a sign that has come in from Arabic uh, astrology. It's called the part of fortune, uh, which I think is calculated by the, calculating the longitude of the moon. Uh, and uh, the ascendant minus the sun gives you the part of uh, fortune. M moon, yeah, 
Moon Ascendant minus Sun gives you a part of fortune, which is your is a good luck sign. This thing over here is Lilith. And Lilith is kind of like the nodes of the moon, except that this has to do with the moon when it is at its apogee, at its furthest point away from the Earth. And it's kind of personified as a dark moon or an alternate moon. And it's basically, as, as you would think, Lilith, it's bitchy energy. Uh, that's what it is. <laughs> I don't know whether there's anything to it or not. I'm not some of these uh, get a bit iffy, especially with the asteroids, because for one thing, there's too damn many asteroids. And the fixed stars, you could just throw out altogether, but that's a complete waste of time. Uh, you cannot just swamp this system with an infinite number of variables and expect to get anything out of it. So I tend to, when I approach astrology, I tend to use Occam's razor uh, and keep it as simple and, as, as possible. And the basic core thing for me are the planets and the angles formed by the planets, which are aspects. So now the aspects are conjunctions. You can see the, that here, uh, the Sun, Venus, and Mars are all conjunct. Here are their marks along Cancer. They're all conjunct here. This is called a stellium, by the way. When you get a grouping of planets that are all uh, conjunct right near each other, that's called a stellium. Um, but then you can also get, um, and down here I have uh, Pluto, Uranus. They form a square here along this red line to my Mercury, which is retrograde, but it's in Gemini which is exalted since uh, Mercury uh, is the ruling planet of Gemini. So we also have ruling planets with uh, each one of these signs has a ruling planet. Mar uh, Aries has Mars as its ruling planet. Taurus has Venus as its ruling planet. Uh, Mercury, as we have said here for Gemini, the moon is the ruling planet here uh, for uh, Cancer. Naturally, the sun would be the ruling planet for Leo. And then for um, Vir uh, Virgo, we have Mercury, again, as the ruling planet. Uh, and then for Libra, we have Venus, again, as the ruling planet. And then for Scorpio, it used to be Mars again, but now Pluto has been assigned to it. Pluto was discovered in 1930, so it's a late addition, but an extremely important addition to the whole pantheon here. Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. Capricorn is ruled by Saturn. And Aquarius used to also be ruled by Saturn, but now it's ruled by Uranus, which was discovered in 1787. And now uh, we have Pisces, which also used to be ruled by Jupiter, but which is now ruled appropriately enough by Neptune. So each one also has a ruling planet, and um, which is the exaltation of that planet in that sign. Um, so we have uh, 90 degree ang angles then are squares. This is a 90 degree angle. Uh, 180 degree angles are oppositions. Um, my Chiron here uh, is in direct 180 degree opposition almost to my Uranus. It's a little bit off. And so we have something called an orb of efficacy where let's say a planet is not, um, let's say you have 15 degrees Taurus, doesn't have to be exactly 15 degrees Taurus on another person's point, uh, chart in order for it to be a conjunction it can be off a little bit by let's say three to five degrees that's an orb of range so there's always an orb of efficacy uh, when it comes to these aspects then we have sextiles which is a 60 degree angle here here I have mercury uh, sextile my Saturn that's a sextile and then we have trines trines are 120 degree angles so that's uh, those are considered sextiles and trines are considered uh, they're based on the sexagesimal system, and there's, so they're considered soft aspects. Whereas the others, uh, the 90 degree angle, the square, the conjunction, and the opposition are considered hard angles. It means the, the energies are tougher. Um, with sextiles and trines, the energies are a little easier, a little softer, let's say. Um, and we missed one little element here. This VX thing is called a vertex. I'm not exactly sure. It has something to do with a west-east aspect and the east aspect of a plane that intersects the meridian. And this wasn't figured out until the 1970s that it has to do with, with fated encounters. Um, okay, so those are the basics. Now, uh, let's look at the combinations here. Um, we also have the houses. Uh, let's go over those. Each one of the houses corresponds to uh, in terms of significance to one of the signs of the zodiac, the first house corresponds to Aries, the second to Taurus, the third to Gemini, and so on. But they have more specific 
it's almost like the sunlight shining through stained glass that modulates uh, the planets in a certain way here. So and the first has to do with individual identity. The second has to do with uh, possessions. Um, and the third has to do uh, the third has to do with it's slipping me for uh, third has to do with the lower mind. Um, so note too that these they, they form oppositions because the nine has to do with the higher mind, the philosophical mind. The third house has to do with the practical mind. So each one of these forms an opposition. The fourth house has to do with the domestic sphere, uh, just as the tenth house has to do with career, the public sphere. And the fifth house has to do with creative self-extension, such as children, love affairs, uh, things like that. The sixth house um, is in opposition to the twelfth house. The twelfth house has to do with the, per the collective unconscious, the realm of the transpersonal. And the sixth house is the opposite of that, where the seventh house, um, it has to do with work, the, the concrete world, not the transpersonal world. The daylight world, let's say, where the twelfth house has to do with the nighttime world. The seventh house has to do with enemies. Um, one's, one's enemies, but also, appropriately enough, marriages. <laughs> um, and then we have also, uh, let's see, the eighth house is the opposite of the second. It has to do with inheritances, whereas the second house has to do with personal possessions. The eighth house has to do with uh, inheritances. Ninth house, as we have said, has to do with the higher mind. Tenth house with the career. And the eleventh house uh, has to do with social relations, basically, generally speaking. Um, so, that's the significance of these houses, which is another way of dividing the ecliptic into 12 signs. Uh, so we have several modulations here. We have the ecliptic, we have the houses, and we have the planets and the aspects that they form together with each other. So now, um, so I have um, Mars conjunct Venus. Uh, that's good, those are sexual energies. Mars has to do with the body. Venus has to do with both sex and art, but as Arthur Young puts it, who uh, is another big astrology guy that I like, uh, he says, it just, for him, Venus just has to do with the principle of satisfaction, generally speaking. That could be sex, it could be aesthetic appreciation, but it could also be satisfaction with money. Um, and the sun, of course, has to do with the waking daylight ego, the personality, and the moon has to do with the emotions. Now, there's a fallacy in astrology that's common that the moon has to do or the, the moon has to do with women. That's a Jungian dogma from Jung's completely mistaken idea that the moon is always feminine. It absolutely is not. Jung didn't know his mythology that well. Um, he knew it in a very helter-skelter, hodgepodge way, but he didn't know the history of the evolution of mythology, whereby the oldest moon gods were gods, moon gods, just exactly as in uh, German, where you have die Sonne, where the sun is feminine, der Mond, the moon is masculine. So. But it does have to do with emotions, I'll grant it that. I would not assign it a valency that has to do with women and the, and the sun with men. Uh, the sun is simply the waking daylight personality and the moon has to do with uh, emotions. Mars has to do with courage, but the negative side is aggression. So all these planets all have a positive inflection and a negative inflection. Uh, Mercury has to do with the mind uh, and the understanding. It is retrograde, so we have to discuss this phenomenon of retrograde planets. Uh, retrograde is, of course, also an illusion, like the fact that the planets rise out of the east and set in the west. That's an optical illusion. But because the planets orbit at different speeds around the sun, it can sometimes look like uh, one planet is overtaking another, and it looks like, uh, with regard to the background of the fixed stars, as it comes around the circle, it looks like the other one's going backwards. But it's simply a function of the differing speeds. And so it's not going backwards. The planets are always going forwards, that is to say, counterclockwise. Um, so Mercury right now, I believe, is in retrograde. Uh, and so Mercury, Mercury is the god of communication and messages and writing and the mind and the intellect. Um, it can sometimes disrupt communications for the two or three weeks that it goes retrograde. Um, so there's some debate about um, if a person has a retrograde intellect, uh, is that person slow? Or, on the other hand, does it uh, accelerate? Uh, in my case, I don't think there's any dispute. Um, and it's also exalted in uh, Gemini. Then it's squared by this very powerful combination of Pluto and Uranus. Uranus is a planet that has to do with revolution. 
but it, that's the positive side of it. The revolutionary breakthroughs. Uh, very often, and Uranus takes 84 years to go around the sun, at which point it would have gone uh, all the way around this way, come back 84 years later, it's your Uranus return. It's about the length of a human lifetime. But at the age of 42, it's going to be over here 180 degrees opposite where it's at. And most great minds have their great breakthroughs, their revolutionary breakthroughs in their 40s. Spangler wrote The Decline of the West at the age of 40. Joseph Campbell wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces at the age of 44. Nietzsche wrote his best books uh, right at that time, and so on and so on. The negative side of Uranus is that it can destabilize things. It may be connected with earthquakes. Um, Saturn, in a certain sense, is, is opposite to Uranus in that Saturn has to do with confinement, discipline, death, and restriction. Saturn is a very stern god, and so it builds structures. The positive side of it is that it does build things, and it does cause discipline. Um, but if you get Uranus in aspect with Saturn, let's say in opposition or conjunction, this can code out in the physical world for accidents, as for example, the space shuttle, both space shuttles, Challenger and uh, Columbia, uh, exploded under Saturn and Uranus aspects. So uh, positive and negative, same thing with Pluto. Pluto is the, probably the most dreaded planet of all of these. Um, its power is out of all, um, it's totally asymmetric to its size, it's about the size of Mercury. Uh, it's very far out. It's been degraded to the status of a dwarf planet. Most astronomers don't take it seriously, but in astrology, it is a very feared planet. Pluto takes about 260 years to go around the sun. Its transits are agonizingly slow. They last about three, three years, roughly. And Pluto is the god of death and resurrection. When you get Pluto on your case, it will completely melt your life down. Pluto's the god of death and resurrection. Pluto comes in and sweeps your life clean of all previous structures, which can be associated with death, pain, and loss of all kinds. Pluto is dark, uh, stonic, underworld energy. Um, but Pluto combined with Uranus, uh, as was the case in the 60s when it went on in the mundane world. The mundane world is the outer world. Um, it went on in the 60s with uh, the revolutions that went on in the 60s that lasted until 1972, um, whereupon everything died because the planets were out of, out of phase by 1972. Uh, the revolutionary spirit was gone. Uh, but if you have an intellect, Mercury, powered by Pluto and Uranus, you're going to have an intellect that likes to dig down deep into things. It's a kind of detective intellect. Arthur Conan Doyle, the guy who invented Sherlock Holmes, had this aspect. Um, and I believe Freud did too. That's that digging deep down into people's hidden motivations. Pluto has to do with the underworld. It codes for underworld types, gangsters, criminals, prostitutes. Um, and it has to do with people's deep, willing, uh, underlying motivations. So then, uh, so we did, let's see, we did this cluster here. And notice that I have all these guys here in the 12th house which is my strength because the 12th house is the collective unconscious and the transpersonal of all these energies activated in the 12th house. This is my interest in spirituality right here. And um, let's see, it, um, over here with the midheaven, with career, uh, I have Chiron, which is the healer. And zero degrees Aries is, is associated, can be associated with fame. Uh, the midheaven can also um, and all of this is squaring this over here at just about a 90 degree angle um, because automatically the ascendant squares the midheaven. And my moon sits right on my ascendant at 11 degrees Cancer. Um, so this, this would code for, I'm not bragging or anything or being egotistical, but this, was, this would code for fame in the, in the realm of spirituality. Um, plus I also have the north node. My south node is where I have been. And this makes sense if we look at my most previous lifetime, the birth chart there, that will tell you that uh, my goal was to get to Saturn. Generally, your highest planet is the planet that you're trying to get to. That's the leading planet, the sort of guiding type of your life. And Saturn has to do with authority. It has to do with law. It has to do with a wise old man. So all of this uh, tends to line up very well at 
right angles with all of this here. This would be my strong point right here, and then down here with Pluto and uh, Uranus. Jupiter has to do with good luck. Jupiter, um, let's see, we should look at the, how quickly these things go around the sun. Uh, Mercury goes around the sun in 88 days, so just like thought, it moves very fast. Uh, Mars takes about two years. Um, the moon moves very, very fast through the day. The sun, of course, uh, takes a year uh, for its solar return, and then Venus takes uh, less, it's quicker than Mars, obviously it's closer to the sun, uh, like three quarters of a year or something like that. Jupiter takes 12 years to return as it goes around the sun. Uh, Uranus, 84 years. Pluto, 250. And then over here we have Neptune, which has to do with spirituality. Uh, I forget, what's it, 160-something years to, for it to go around the sun. Now, uh, the positive side of Pluto is spirituality. The negative side of it is addiction. Um, so that's the positive and the negative side of it. And um, here I have... Uh, a sextile, a 60 degree angle that in blue there you can see that is 60 degrees with this very powerful Pluto-Uranus conjunction. They're close enough in Virgo here to be conjunct. Uh, so that would explain my interest, very strong, intense interest in spirituality. Um, and then what else do we have left here? So those are the basics of my chart. Um, and Jupiter, as I said, has to do with good luck. Uh, it's, Jupiter transits are very often associated with windfalls, uh, good luck at something, inheriting money, uh, and so forth. Jupiter and Saturn are opposites. They are both the kingly archetypes. Uh, this is the grumpy king, and this is the jovial, beneficent king. Um, there's a scene in Lord of the Rings, the Two Towers, where they go into uh, to visit the King Theoden with Grima Wormtongue. And he's in the role, he's the Saturnian king when they encounter him. He's sitting there grizzled and old and grumpy in his chair. And then he undergoes a magical transformation and becomes the Jupiter king, the jovial king. So uh, Saturn constricts and restricts. Jupiter expands anything that it touches. So they have opposite energies. All right, so let's take a look at transits then. Um, let's see. next one here. All right, so these are my transits uh, for today. Make sure that came up right. Uh, no, let's see. Yeah, I'm having trouble bringing up the chart with all the transits in it. We may have to do a second video for that. Doesn't seem to want to come up. All right, well, we'll pause it for this video for the basics of my chart, and then we'll do another video on the transits since uh, they don't want to come up. But we'll stop here with that.